completely off, if you will, as it interferes with our microphones. Uh, a couple of birthdays coming up this week. Uh, Nicole and Idris are both going to be celebrating birthdays, so happy birthday to you both. And, uh, and also a week of prayer of um, Sally, Lois, Joyce, uh, Joan Palmer's family. Of course, the announcement went out this week that Joan has passed on into the kingdom. And, uh, but keep our family, Steve and, and um, his son Scott, I'm sorry, Scott, in prayer, please. Um, and um, Camp Oneida is coming up. We have some children that are interested in going. Uh, we're hoping to do kind of a bit of a fundraiser to uh, send them. But if there are any other children that we don't know at this point that would like to go, I know um, if you're listening online and your children would like to go to Camp Oneida, please get in touch with Stian or myself. And we will do everything that we can to get you to Camp Oneida for a wonderful experience. Uh, years and years ago, I was a camp counselor there, and it was exhausting, <laughs> but it was such a fun week. Um, so, if uh, any of our children would like to go to camp, please let us know. Please let us know. And, uh, yeah, so I think that these are all the announcements that I have. So, Roger, if you would come up, because today is a special Sunday again. Sundays can close. You may already remember that on the last Sunday of every month, uh, things that I've learned, this is from 2023, but in 2023, number one, Genesis reached five feet tall. That's kind of amazing. That's crazy. Five feet tall already. Um, Genesis uh, really good in school. She got uh, A plus plus for enthusiasm, A plus for curiosity, A plus for teamwork, and A plus for hard work. And that says a lot about her. Um, she loves to water plants at home and look after them. She speaks English and Spanish. Her favorite animals uh, are dogs. She loves dogs. Uh, she has a, thanks to our support, there, part, part of our support goes towards a fully stocked health center near her home. She did great in school and passed her grade, probably do that. And she did great in school and hopes to continue to be able to pass each grade. She reads books for fun. <laughs> she walks to school. That's so unusual up here in Canada these days. So she, she walks to school every day. She assists with schoolyard school yard chores. She helps the teacher. She's just a great kid. And uh, her full name is, we always say Janet for supporting Genesis, but her full name is Genesis Abigail Campos Jimenez. There's some, some things that you didn't know about Genesis. The box will be out, and whatever coins or whatever you would like to put in towards supporting her on a monthly basis, we'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, and about Camp Oneida. Right. Uh, on June 6th, uh, our eldest, our daughter, will be 48. And I remember taking her to Camp Oneida. I know. It is a great place. <laughs> <laughs> Been there a long time. Tell you about that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's a new one. No. Stephen, I know you're counting, but could you just grab the instruments that are in the little basket in there? If anybody would like to grab an instrument, there is some instruments that will be involved in the morning worship. So. Either on the other one, if you're interested in the one or two. Is that your announcement? Okay. Good morning. Yeah, we can all jingle 
And may all that we sing, all that we say, all that we do, all that we are, bless you. For you are our great God. Holy, holy, holy is your name. Amen. It's <laughs> also with you. Before we begin uh, our, our next praise time, would you just remain seated and I'll ask you to stand up at some point.
God, there is so much you have done for us in our lives. From day to day, you are with us. You provide for us. You care for us. And you love us so intimately. And we thank you that we can give back to you. Back into your kingdom, Lord. May these gifts, may our hearts be swelled toward you. And may all that we do in your name bring glory to you. For you are such an awesome God, Lord. May you use these gifts, these tithes and offerings for your kingdom. And may we be your kingdom people on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
by trying our best not to sin, by talking to God when we need to, praying, worshiping the Lord. I think all that stuff will work if we're just trying our best to do it. What do we need to do? We need to believe first. Believe in what? That we can do better? We believe that we can do better. So if I believe I can do better, I can do better all by myself? No. Not all by myself. Okay. Oh, now we're getting somewhere with the Lord's help. Okay. So if I need to switch from this, then I need this. What's that? The cross. The cross. What happened on the cross? Jesus. Jesus died and and what? He took away our sin. That's right. So he made us go from this to this. And then, as Carrie said, today is Trinity Sunday. Last week we were talking about the Holy Spirit that came on all the disciples um, because the Holy Spirit, because Jesus ascended into heaven, so Jesus is now in heaven, but he sent us the Holy Spirit. And this Holy Spirit helps us to be like this, to be more like Jesus. So we need the cross of Jesus. And we need the Holy Spirit to come into our hearts. How does that happen? You said it earlier. Remember what you said? We have to believe. Believe that Jesus died for us. We have to ask him into our heart. Say, I want you to live in my heart forever and I want to follow you. And then his Holy Spirit comes to us. Us. To live in us. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? We change from this to this. By the power of Jesus Christ down on the cross and his Holy Spirit in our hearts and our lives. That's wonderful. And we become then a whole new human being. We become a whole new creature. We're who we are. We're who we're born to be, but we're who we are in Christ as a wholeness and the fullness of who he wanted us to be without sin. Right? Wow. I think that's amazing that God would do that for you and for me and everyone. Let's have a prayer, and then you can go down to Sunday school, okay? Jesus, thank you. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for us. For dying on the cross for us. And sending us your Holy Spirit. And sending us your Holy Spirit. To make us more like you. To make us more like you. We thank you for your gift. We thank you for your gift. It's the most amazing gift we could receive. It's the most amazing gift we could receive. Let us always live in your way. Let us always live in your way. With your Holy Spirit within us. Amen. Amen. All right. And we pray for healing for your ankle, that it will get better. Before we hear scripture, we're going to uh, sing the Trinity one more time. And we'll sing all our verses here, and then we'll sing it again. Get around. And I know you know how to do that, so here we go.
Not many could boast of this encounter back then. One time occurred in Genesis 16:13, where Hagar proclaimed of seeing God, and then later in Exodus 24:10, Moses, Aaron, and the 70 elders went up the mountain and saw God. Much like the selected others in the Old Testament who encountered the glory of God, Isaiah's moments in the presence of God are pivotal in his life. Isaiah stands before a majestic and sovereign Lord who is highly exalted. The seraphs in his presence continually cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And though they are heavenly creatures, they are so awed by this God that they must cover their faces and their feet as though they are covering their nakedness before him who is so high and exalted. And Isaiah's visual image shows us a God who fills the temple and the presence, filling every empty space as his glory shines into every recess. And we are left with the feeling that even outside the temple walls, the glory of God was present, flowing outward into the world. All around saw the glory. And Isaiah is in the presence of one who is so awe-inspiring that one could feel their very life was in danger. He stands aware of the awesomeness of God and in his divine presence, Isaiah dramatically feels his own unworthiness. I am ruined, he cries out. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. He mourns for himself and God's community in humility, and suddenly, Suddenly, one of the seraphs flies and separates himself from the others, and flying at Isaiah with a burning coal touches his lips from the altar. And the confession of sin pours forth from Isaiah as God's holiness clearly displays the dramatic span between human frailty and the perfection of God. And in God's mercy, the guilt that Isaiah had felt is taken away, and his sin is atoned for. Hallelujah. It's a foretaste of the cross on which Jesus hung, taking our sin and our guilt in his atoning sacrifice. For not until then is Isaiah ready to take up the divine call that God has placed on him. Though he himself is cleansed, the people have not yet received this blotting out of their sins. Instead, Isaiah has been set apart to proclaim to the people the message that God will give to him to give to them. And God speaks to the heavens when he asks the question of eternity. Who shall I send? Who will go for us. Note the plural there because there's God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Who will go for us? And from the mouth of a meek man boldly come forth the words, Here I am. Send me. Have you said that to God? Here I am. Send me. It's a reminder for you and me that Though we may think we are inadequate, and I know that we oftentimes do, when we trust God to equip and empower us, he will do so for the tasks that he has prepared, prepared in advance for us to do. Paul, the apostle, wrote, I can do all things through Christ who has strengthened me. Amen? And Isaiah and Paul's attitudes are in contrast with Nicodemus who is a learned man. He's actually a very impressive man with impressive credentials. He's known as a ruler of the Jews, and Jesus calls him a teacher of Israel. 
Nicodemus is one who thinks he knows it all and he has arrived. He begins by saying, we know, but he does not really know, as we see. He does not understand what Jesus is saying to him. The humility of Isaiah is not present in Nicodemus as he approaches God. And Jesus challenges Nicodemus to move from knowledge from up here to faith. And though Nicodemus thinks that as a religious leader, he understands Jesus, Jesus directly calls that knowledge into question. See, he thinks that because he has heard and seen Jesus in action, that he knows God is with Jesus. But Jesus is blunt, and he cuts to the heart of the matter. He says, no one can see God's reign without being born again from above. Now, this is where I love the languages. The English language does not really give us as much understanding as we need to hear the play on words here. In the Greek language, the term born has one word for fathering a child and another for giving birth. Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, you need to be born again from the heavenly Father. A second time, and the heavenly Father will do this. But Nicodemus does not ask how this can be, but instead asks, how when someone is old, they can give birth to the adult that they had already birthed to the womb. They speak the same subject, but a very different process. And Jesus is saying that we must be born both anew and from above. And this is an act of God alone. We sometimes say, I've been born again. I'm a born again Christian. You say I'm a born again Christian? Yeah. But I want to ask you that are mothers or that have had mothers and have had a child, did you decide or did your baby make the decision to be born into the world? Uh, I believe that it was not their choice or your choice. You see, God is the director of our life and our death. And so this moves us in a different direction entirely because it is God's action in our life. And Jesus is talking not about physical rebirth, but about spiritual rebirth as he talks to Nicodemus. And he continues to tell this nighttime visitor that we must be born again of water and the spirit Water baptism is important, according to Jesus. I remember when I switched from the United Church to the Baptist Church. I had been baptized as a baby in the United Church, and I thought that that was all I needed to serve God. Um, these words read today were shown to me by Pastor Dan at the time, and I saw that I had had no control when I was a baby to have water poured over my head. But as an adult, I definitely had a decision to make. And for me, it was to undergo full immersion baptism to display my love and devotion to Jesus Christ, who is my Lord and my Savior. And this decision stems way back into um, the book of Ezekiel where God promised to sprinkle his people with water, to make them clean and put a new spirit within them. In water baptism, we, we die as we go under the water, and as we rise up, we are resurrected in Christ. Amen? I remember my experience. It was amazing. Truly, truly. Romans 6, 1, 11, and Acts 2, 38 declare at our water baptism that we receive the Holy Spirit. And I will tell you that unless you are filled with the Holy Spirit, 
with God's Holy Spirit, we have more power to do His will on this earth. We must be filled, as we heard last week. And when we place our trust in Jesus Christ, we are promised eternal life by being reborn from above and by the water and by the Spirit. And like God's breath that breathed life into humankind in Genesis 2, the Spirit gives us life. And like the wind, God's Spirit blows wherever He wishes, sharing in the mysterious freedom of the Spirit. We often think that eternal life, you know, eternal life, it doesn't start now, it starts in heaven, but I'm going to tell you, it starts here. And it starts now, the moment the Spirit comes into us. We who have been baptized in the water and the Spirit are now citizens of God's kingdom. And as we submit to God's rule, and as we depend upon the Spirit's guidance, we are born into a new family and are citizens together. Hallelujah. And this comes to us by faith, by believing in Jesus Christ. It's not head knowledge, not religious training. And Nicodemus shows us that. He shows us that it's dependent on God's spirit. You see, otherwise, if it was dependent on, on this, then he as a wise and trained man would already have known that. But he does not. He's confused. And he's unable to enter this new life through his intellect. It took Jesus to die on the cross before he truly took a step toward commitment to Jesus. He took a great risk by bringing the owls and myrrh to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus. This was a leader of Israel, a Pharisee. With these anoints. Jesus invites us to receive that from him as well, to receive life in its fullest as he died upon the cross. He is the crucified Son of God, and in his act, he shows us the greatest thing that we could ever receive of his divine love. We are. Given. We are made whole, and we are remade in Jesus Christ in God's image, participating in God's new creation. Oh, we have encountered the glory of God through the cross, hallelujah. Praise God, we have. And praise God for our heavenly moment. When his spirit entered us, giving us a new life in him. Amen.
come to you hiding in the shadows of our own fears and terrors as we long for your peace to flood the world. We cry out for your presence. We want to know that everything will be all right, that the world will cease to be a place of terror and war and anger and everything else that's going on these days. We wonder, do you hear our cries? How small is our faith? From the very beginnings of time, you have poured your love into this world. And people have made decisions about how to respond to that love. Some, many, have chosen to act in ways of peace, justice, mercy, and loving ministries of kindness and compassion. Oh, but some have chosen, Lord, to impose their will on others, never acknowledging the rights and lives of those they oppress. Sometimes we, by our attitudes as well as our actions, have acted in ways of oppression too. But you have forgiven us and healed us. And you call us to be your witnesses of peace to the world. We do not need to call to you during the night of our fears for healing because you have given us new life in Jesus Christ. He who taught us about your love. Oh, Father God, we want to be born again in the spirit of hope, learning what you would have us to do and be in this world. Through Christ we are adopted as your heirs, as your beloved children. And you have given us opportunities to bring hope and peace and joy to others. Let us seize these opportunities for ministries of hope. Encourage our hearts, God. Strengthen our spirits and our commitment to serve you. Calm our fears. Heal our spirits. Empower us to bring peace which is not only an absence of war, Lord, but the peace of shalom, which promotes an attitude of love for all. And Lord, most of all, clear away the clutter in our lives and place us on paths of service to you. In Jesus' name we pray.
presence and dazzling surprises. Be with us as we leave this place today. Guide and guard our lives and bless our witness to your love. We go in peace, seeking ministries of justice and hope. Amen. Amen. Amen.